Goedemorgen. Dit is die 1 januari 2023. Amazing. Een nieuwe jaar wat begin. Ik is werkelijk opgewonden om te zien wat die Heere hier die jaar in elke van ons levens gaan doen. Als ook in die gemeente en dier die gemeente. Ik is een totale afwachting en, en eindelijk opgewonden so in, my, in, in my mens wees. Mag jij je geziende geest vervulde en vreugdevolle jaar beleef in Christus hier die jaar 2023. Mag hij jou hier die nieuwe jaar leid door sy geest en jou krachtig gebruik vir hom in die levens van ander. Volgende zondag kom ons allemaal, volgende zondag die 8 januari, is ons allemaal weer saam bij die gemeente bij elkaar, waar ons die Heerse naam gaan groot maak en hoor wat hij voor ons wil sê. Nou, vandaag het ons die voorrecht om naar Mats Dijssel te luisteren. En die titel van haar boodschap voor ochtend is Mental Health and Ministry. Her passion is to see people walk in the fullness of who they meant to be. To see them walk in the fullness of their identity and their authority. A question that she asked, and she also answered it through this teaching, is how do we not give up? She's not saying how do we give up, but how do we not give up? How do we persevere in our faith and in our calling? How do we handle tension, storms, and trouble well when we are exhausted? She also reads from Hebrews 8, so you can turn there so long. Enjoy this powerful teaching that will help you overcome fear, depression, and stay focused on Christ. Be blessed by this teaching. One of the things that I am so aware of is that God has uniquely knit each one of us together with a specific task and purpose and calling. And um, this is not what I'm speaking about. This is a bonus, okay? I'm just starting off with something more fun. But one of the things that I'm incredibly passionate about, because I've seen it in my own life, is that when we are faithful to the step in front of us, no more, no less, God will take you on an incredibly amazing adventure and journey. And so often when we feel called and we like, God, use me, I have a passion for you. We're like, what on earth do I do now? Like, how is this going to play out? Where is this going to land me? But you don't have to worry about that. If you are just faithful to the step that God is showing you in front of you, God will take you on an incredible journey. And one of the things that I'm passionate about not just as a counselor, because as a counselor, I generally hear people's backstories, the things that they struggle with, the things that they're wrestling with, the traumas and the troubles that they're facing. And we're going to touch a little bit into that in a bit. But one of the things I'm passionate about is seeing people walk into the fullness of who they are meant to be. You know, as we're, as we're born into this world, we know this world is broken. And so often as we grow up in lives, we, we kind of inherit or we stumble into injuries that result in us limping. And one of the things that I want to see people do is to find what it means to walk in the fullness of their identity and their authority. Because then we're going to start to see the world change. And uh, so that's a big space that I'm really passionate about is just empowering people on that journey into healing and wholeness so that we really can start to be a bringers of hope to a world that is incredibly broken and hurting. Now, I just want to give you some insights into mental health, and then we're going to be looking at how we can apply this into our own worlds as we walk a journey of, of ministry, for, especially for those who feel called. Uh, on the 2nd of March this year, the World Health Organization put up a post in a news release stating that because of the COVID pandemic, there has been an increase in the prevalence of anxiety and depression by 25%. And so, I don't know if any of you remember geography back in the day at school. Well, some of you are actually quite young, so you probably might still be learning this. Uh, but the only thing I remember in geography was when they taught us about fault lines. Anybody remember fault lines? 
I'm seeing a few heads nodding. Now, fault line is a weakness in the earth's surface that when a new pressure is placed, it results in earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, etc., etc. Now, we don't realize the fault lines on our lives until a new pressure is placed on us. In other words, you won't realize you've got the fault line of impatience until you bring home a newborn and you don't get much sleep, okay? And COVID has been a fault line. And the reality is that as COVID has put new pressures across the world, it's revealed the fault lines in our faith, in our character, because you see, the strength of your foundation is only realized when a storm hits. And we're going to touch into that a little bit. And so I want to just give you some statistics into mental health and why I believe the church right now really is in a position to be the most incredible resource of hope to a world that is hurting and broken and lost. Now, they say from a statistics perspective, and I think my stats are coming up, if there they are, one in three at some point are going to struggle with a mental health issue. Now, these stats are pre-COVID, okay? So it's probably even higher than what I'm sharing. So one in three at some point are going to struggle with a mental health issue. Of those one in three, one in four should be seeing a professional. Of those one in four that should be seeing a professional, one in ten can actually afford it. So when you look at the numbers in South Africa of 60 million, if one in three need to, you know, are going to struggle at some point, that's 20 million people that are going to be struggling with mental health issues. But of those 20 million, 5 million should be seeing a professional. But of those 5 million, only half a million can actually afford it. Now, my biggest holy discontent with being a counselor and the profession of counseling is that we live in a world where people are paying strangers to listen to them. Just think about that concept. Imagine if we started to create a new culture for authentic masks off conversations. And I'm so grateful that our physical masks are no longer on. But many of us are still walking around with other masks because we're hiding actually what's really going on inside. Statistics also say that when it comes to mental health, from first symptom to treatment, most people wait 11 years before asking for help. The reason being is because we carry a lot of shame and because we're measuring our behind-the-scenes struggles with everybody else's perfect Facebook profile pics. And we're declaring, you know what, I'm the only one that struggles. How many of you have felt like you're the only one that is struggling with what you're struggling in? And so we all come to church and we put on our fine faces. Does everybody know what fine stands for? Feeling insecure, neurotic, and emotional. And someone says, how are you doing? I'm fine. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I just want to cry. But <laughs> and so, so many people carry deep shame and insecurities and fears around our own struggles, but we put on these fine faces. And I think one of the other reasons why we struggle so often is because many people also don't realize that there's actually a spectrum of resources available when it comes to mental and emotional well-being. We all know what to do with physical health. You know, if we get a sore throat, we can get over-the-counter medication, we can chat to a GP or a pharmacist, but if necessary, go see a specialist. But when it comes to mental and emotional health, as I said, most people wait 11 years before asking for help because they don't realize that there really is a spectrum of resources. And this spectrum of resources is actually broken down into four levels. Self-care, community care, pastoral care, and professional care. Now, if you've ever read the story of Moses, Moses was once dealing with the needs of the people from morning to night, and his father-in-law came along and said to him, hey, what you're doing is not sustainable. You see, we're living in a world now where we've also seen a dramatic increase in the need for help when it comes to emotional and, and, and mental care. And Jethro gave Moses a three-step strategy. He said, one, teach people the laws and decrees. In other words, self-care. Empower people with resources to own their stuff. Two, he said, divide people into groups of tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds, and help them help those groups of people. So that's community care. 
And pastoral care, he said, bring the more complicated cases to yourself. And for me, this is really exciting because when you look at those statistics, remember only one in four should be seeing a professional. The other three of those four will respond to basic interventions. And this is for me where the local church has got the most incredible opportunity to be bringers of hope. Because if you think about it, every depression and anxiety started somewhere. You don't just wake up suddenly and now you've got depression. It's just like you also just don't wake up and now you're in stage four cancer. It starts somewhere, but most people avoid it for years and years, and it becomes unprocessed emotion, which ends up with a mental health issue. And so if we can create cultures where we can facilitate masks off conversations, then we start to, in a sense, put an end to potentially people needing to see professionals because we've created safe spaces. There's an author called David Orsberger. He wrote the book, Caring Enough to Hear and Be Heard. And he says this, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, it's almost indistinguishable. Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, it's almost indistinguishable. So again, imagine the impact the local church can have when we really start to create safe spaces for people to be heard. When I looked at, I've got that diagram of self-care, community care, pastoral care, and professional care, and I got a mathematician to work out the percentage of what each of those levels represents in terms of the needs of people, and he divided it into 53%, 33, 13, and 3. And so when you add the first two levels, that equals 86% of people's needs are met when we just invest in basic interventions. And that's why I'm really passionate about doing what I'm doing and speaking into the space because Hosea talks about the fact that people perish because of a lack of knowledge. And that includes self-awareness. If I don't understand why I'm thinking, feeling, and behaving the way I do, then I'm going to just keep repeating cycles because that's all I know, wondering why I'm not getting a different result. And so it's so important that we invest into these spaces. Colossians 3 verse 16 says very clearly, teach and counsel each other. But if we're not investing in God's word, how do we do that? How do we walk journeys with other people? Now, I've only recently moved to Joburg. Well, I've been here four years now, and um, I'm originally from Durban. And uh, I, when I first moved to Joburg, I experienced for the first time the electrical thunderstorms you have here. They're amazing. Okay, they're pretty spectacular. But I remember my first summer that I was at home. I think my husband was away. He was traveling. And one of those uh, lightning bolts struck our garden, and it was pretty loud. And literally the whole house, kids, dogs, cats, everyone, all came running to me. I think we all jumped on the bed because we thought that way we like were grounded. I don't know what I was thinking. And we we're like, oh my gosh, are we going to die? You know, like, is the house going to fall down? But when my husband's home and one of those thunderstorm hits, it almost feels like we can laugh at the storm. You see, my husband's a real MacGyver. Does anybody remember the, the TV show back in the day, MacGyver? All those over 40 have nodded their heads. All those under 40 are like, who's MacGyver? Okay, well, MacGyver was my first heartthrob, and uh, I had his poster above my bed. He was very handsome, but he was one of these guys that could literally fix anything. He kind of made up little inventions. He was just the coolest dude ever, and my husband's like a MacGyver. He, he can fix anything, so when he's home, it kind of gives me a deeper sense of confidence when a storm hits. And the reason why I tell you this story is because the reality is our experience of storms change when we know who's in the boat with us and we know the power of the one in the boat with us. Now, COVID is almost like a storm that has hit the world and it's caused a lot of people to become incredibly anxious and they're looking for a boat to jump on. They're looking for a bed to hang on to. They're like, oh my gosh, who's gonna rescue us from this space? And the storms that we face are the equivalent to the crises that we go through in life, the traumas, the troubles, the tensions that we all go through. And it's important to understand impact of storms on people's worlds because everybody's going through something. 
and when you're listening to people's stories, and, and my heart when, I, when, I'm, when I'm teaching is to empower you with the ability to be more effective in discipleship. Because that's what it means to be called and sent. Where I'm empowered to walk journeys with others into a world that is needing messengers of hope. So as I'm sharing this, I want you to understand this from a perspective of when I'm engaging in conversation with people around me who I love and care for, and I'm walking journeys with them, and I'm listening to their stories, it's almost like I'm listening to a storm. What impact is this storm having on this person's life? Sometimes there's an intensity of storm. You know, you can go to the Drakensberg and you get one of those little afternoon thunder showers. They're quite refreshing. There's nothing really intense about it. We quite enjoy them. And then you can get one of your thunderstorms here and it's intense and it's scary or you can get a tornado or a tsunami or whatever it is. And so the intensity of the storm can really impact a person's world. The other thing to consider is the duration of the storm. Is it a quick storm and it's over in a few minutes? Or has it been going on for weeks? like the floods in Natal that caused havoc. Then we've got frequency in the storm. You know, sometimes you listen to people's stories and it feels like they're going through one thing after the next, after the next, after the next. And you're like, oh my gosh, how are you even breathing right now as you're going through all of this? But the key thing I want you to understand when listening to people's stories is perspective. So when I lived in Durban, I used to surf a lot. Unfortunately, there's not much waves up here. I heard you got a beach in Pretoria, but it's, it's waveless, so I haven't been there. Um, but I know what it's like to get dumped by a six-foot wave. And for me, my perspective of that is that it's not life or death. It's not traumatic because I know that a wave will generally not hold you down longer than 20 seconds and then it'll spit you up and there's, there's a gap between the waves and then there's an even longer gap between the sets. And so when you've got this perspective, your experience of that doesn't become as traumatic versus if you guys go down and you've never been to the sea and you've never walked in waves and a little two-foot wave knocks you over and you're only waist deep, it's going to feel like life or death for you. So perspective is so important. I never had a perspective of electrical thunderstorms. And so for me, when that first lightning bolt hits, it felt like life or death, you know. But now as we, as we change our perspective, we experience things so differently. Again, who's in the boat with you? And knowing the power of the one in the boat is the difference between life or death in your own experience of a storm. So discipleship is about understanding and pointing people to the one in the boat and revealing the strength of the one in the boat. Now, for me, I believe that the local church today is positioned in such a beautiful space because you see the power and the gift of storms is that it creates an opportunity for us to consider the foundations we're built on. You only realize the strength of your foundation when a storm hits. If you've been to the beaches and you see those artists that make structures out of sand, they can make an incredible sand castle, and that castle will stay standing whilst the sun is shining. And for a lot of people, the sun may still be shining. But the reality is, is that scripture is very clear that in this world, there will be troubles and storms will come. And if we, if we can leverage storm opportunities to go, what is my foundation actually built on? And how do I invest in that space? I started the counseling ministry uh, at Grace Family Church nearly 16 years ago. And Grace back then was one campus, two services, but it was a fast-growing church. And I was told, you know what, you're going to need a team, you're going to need to write a counseling course and start training people. And I was like, how on earth do you do that? And the advice that was given to me, are you ready for it? Really wise advice? I was told, go figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, thanks for that. And that's why this journey has literally been one of trusting God every step of the way. And for those of you who feel called even into church planting, you don't have to have it all figured out. Just be faithful to the step in front of you. But one of the things I learned along the way is that I love to keep statistics because statistics tell us information. And as I was training up counselors and running the counseling ministry, I would look at who was coming for counseling and where they were from. In the beginning, 50% of the people were from Grace, 40% were from other churches, and 10% were unchurched. 
And then I thought, imagine if I invited more churches to come for training and they started their own counseling ministry, what would happen? So I did that, and the numbers changed. 40% were now from Grace, 10% were from other churches, and 50% were unchurched. You see, counseling is missional. And this, again, is the exciting thing about the local church, because when the local church starts to be relevant to the needs and the hurts of the people around them, the church will come, I mean, the people will come into the church. Grace Counseling did an audit last year. They've got now 150 volunteer counselors at four different locations in Durban. And we added up how many counseling hours did they do? They did nearly over, how many was, over 5,000 counseling hours last year. And if you divide that by eight-hour working day, that's something like 625 full working days of counseling hours. The local church served the community with. If you put a monetary value to that of just 600 rand an hour, half of what professionals pay, that's three million rands worth of hours that the local church served its community with. Imagine with me, imagine if every church just invested in one of those resources from self-care, community care, or pastoral care. And I've invested and in, in written courses uh, into each of these levels so that I can empower people because my heart is to empower people with basic tools for the journey so we can be more effective in this space. Now, I wanted to speak into a space that I think a lot of people are struggling with especially when it comes to the, the burnout space and the mental health space. A lot of people are feeling really overwhelmed. How many of you knew someone or yourself got COVID in the first six months of COVID? And when you got sick then, you had people dropping off food and rosters for food. And I mean, you were really looked after, am I right? If you got COVID in the last year, People are like, man, just use the Checker 60-second you know, app. Like, get it yourself. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's almost like our capacity to be able to meet the needs of others when we've been in this for so long has just dwindled. And the reality is, is that there's actually reasons for it. And so I want to speak into, into the space because the um, Lifeway Research uh, and Barna did a... Did a, a, a um, research into what are the biggest struggles in the local church at the moment, especially for those in leadership and ministry and those who are pastors. Because apparently there's almost been a 42% increase in church ministry leaders and pastors wanting to quit. And the two reasons is because of stress, discouragement, and loneliness. That people are exhausted and our capacities to sit with other people's emotions and storms and problems, it's kind of like we're just over it. We just want to move on. Now, it's in the interesting thing about stress, and I want to just quickly read a definition, is that stress is a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from an adverse or demanding circumstance that specifically appears beyond our ability to cope with successfully. So two people can be facing stress or facing difficulties, but if one is telling themselves, I don't think I will survive this, it will automatically result in a higher level of stress in their lives. If the story I'm telling myself when I'm facing a trial is, you know what, I'm going to be all right, then my stress levels are not going to go up. So stress is always about perspective, in terms of, am I going to succeed? Am I going to fail? Or am I going to be in the crisis? Now, one of the biggest mistakes we make when we're listening to people's stories is we believe that we have to solve the problem of their stories. That's one of the reasons why most people don't want to stick in counseling or don't want to keep listening to people's stories because we're like, oh my gosh, I feel powerless to do anything effective in your story. I feel powerless to actually bring you a solution to your story. <clears throat> the reality is, is that we're not there to solve the story. We're meant to point people to the one that's in the boat with them so that they understand that they're not having to deal with their story alone. <clears throat> so I'm going to speak into three spaces. <clears throat> Weights, worries, and weariness. 
A lot of us are carrying weights and worries that are making us tired. One thing I'm so aware of, <clears throat> the Bible talks about how we need to be aware of the schemes and strategies of the devil. Now, as a counselor, I see the fruit often of the schemes and strategies of the devil playing out in the counseling room. Last year, 50% of the clients that I was counseling were pastors who were burnt out. They were overwhelmed and they wanted nothing more to do with people's stuff. And one of the biggest schemes and strategies of the enemy is that if he can't stop you from becoming a Christ follower, he's going to do everything in his power to make you an ineffective one. So either he's going to keep you stuck in fears and insecurities and stresses and shames and try and make you believe that you're disqualified from ever being used by him, or he's going to do the opposite. He's going to try and burn you out as quickly as possible. And one of the biggest ways to do that is through weights. <clears throat> Hebrews 12 verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set for us. I'm going to unpack each of these in a bit, but I want to read the next verse, which talks about worries. Philippians 4 verse 6 says this, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He's done. So strip off weights and don't worry. Pretty easy, hey? So we think. <clears throat> and then Galatians 6 verse 9 said us, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at a proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So strip off weights, don't worry, and don't become weary. Now the biblical description of a weight is a burden or an encumbrance. How's that for a nice big word? An encumbrance is somebody who is dependent on you for support. Your kids are encumbrances, <laughs> okay? Um, if you're a kid, you're an encumbrance. But it's a, you're a wanted one. But so often we find ourselves in spaces where we have encumbrances on our lives. And we carry the weight. Now, we're all called to carry each other's burdens. But the problem is, Scripture says very clearly, when it comes to responsibilities, that we need to, I'm just looking for it, Philippians 2 verse 12 says that we need to work out our neighbor's salvation. I'm just testing to see if you're listening. I, I do have the graveyard shift here. You know that. You, got, you just had lunch. All this blood's going to your stomach, not your brain. <clears throat> it says, work out your own. Thank you so much. Did you hear that frog in my throat? It was croaking in there. Work out your own salvation. I've been looking for a gym instructor that will do the workout for me where I get the benefits. I still can't find one, but wouldn't that be great? Okay. Now, often when you find yourself carrying the weight of somebody else, it's because you're trying to do the workout for them. You're trying to convince them about why they should change. And, and the reality is, is that when we're carrying weights that don't belong to us, it will lead to burnout. Often we find ourselves in spaces where people are putting expectations of who we should be and what we should do and why didn't you phone me and why did you phone me and why didn't you say this and why did you say this and it's almost like we can't keep up with the expectations of the world around us to the point where eventually we feel like we're totally overwhelmed and I can't do this anymore. The biblical description of worry comes from the root word Mermanio, don't trust my Greek, okay. <laughs> but it actually is connected to the word merizo, which means to divide, to be drawn in different directions, to be distracted by anxious cares. The word worry comes also from the term, the, the, the term which means to choke. Worry does exactly that. It chokes our mental and our emotional life. It causes a strangulation. Worry will make things worse because when you worry about the future, you cripple yourself on the present. And most people are either living in the past of regrets or the future of worry, which makes them ineffective in the present. And Scripture is very clear. Don't worry, pray. 
You see, worrying puts me in a position where I'm trying to manage something that I actually have no control over. And so when I'm feeling powerless over my circumstances, I will try and find behavior that makes me feel powerful. But often the behavior I turn to is destructive. The biblical description of the word weariness is to be utterly spiritless, to be worn out, to lose courage, to be exhausted. And here's an interesting one, to behave badly. You see, when I've been carrying weights for too long, and I'm out worrying about things that I actually have no power to, to do anything about, what ends up happening is I get to the point where apathy kicks in, to the point where I don't care anymore. It's a very dangerous space to be because what ends up happening is often people will choose behavior that is destructive as a means for getting out. And weights and worries will lead to weariness, and weariness will lead to us picking up more weights and therefore more worries. You see, whatever behavior you escape to, you will become enslaved by it. And I've told it to people who are like, you know what, it started off with just having half a glass of wine whilst cooking every evening. It was my, it was my exhale half an hour in the evening. And that half a glass became a full glass, became half a bottle, became a full bottle, became an addiction. Whatever I escape to, to deal with emotional distresses, I often can become enslaved by. And burnout is a very easy thing. Researchers have studied disaster. And there's actually four phases to a disaster. The first phase is the heroic phase. How many of you remember when COVID first hit? Everybody was sewing masks and you know, kind of doing meal plans and what can I do to help? There was this immediate response to how can I help if somebody was in a disaster? Whether it's COVID or whether it's a pile up on the freeway or whether somebody's gone through a death, it's the same thing. Everybody's first steps into the heroic phase and it normally lasts a couple of hours because it's very intense when you're in the, in the action of it. The second phase of a disaster is the honeymoon phase where communities gather together and we create meal plans and you do it this night and I'll connect that night and, you know, we share things and we come together as a means of trying to alleviate the need and the crisis. Normally last a couple of weeks, maybe a few months. But then slowly we shift into what is known as the disillusionment phase. And this is where the need doesn't diminish, but the resources begin to diminish. And so our capacity and our empathy and our tanks start to run empty. And there's two things that happen. Those that are still in need start to get angry because now I've been disappointed. Like, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you cared. Like, why are you not supporting me? Why are you not there for me? And those that are in the helping sp space start to feel guilty that they're failing everybody around them. It's the proverbial, you can give a man a fish and you feed him for a moment. But if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So how do we move from the disillusionment phase to the reconstruction phase? And the reality is, is that when people start to realize that things are not changing and that I need to own my own journey of healing and wholeness, Flexibility and adaptability start to kick in. You see, what happens in trauma and tensions and burnout and all of these spaces is we become rigid in our thinking. And I always say, you, you can't surf a wave with straight legs. You'll wipe out. Flexibility and adaptability are the most important skills that we need to learn, especially because we live in a world constantly full of tensions and traumas and crises. If we don't learn the skill of flexibility and adaptability, then how do we ever shift into a reconstruction phase? I read an article published about burnout and pastors. Listen to what this guy says. This is a pastor. His name's Richard White. He's been in ministry for 33 years as a pastor in North Carolina, and he says this. His staff first experienced a flood of energy as they scrambled to adjust to the COVID-19 protocols. Can you hear the heroic phase? They thought it would only last for two weeks. 
They did their best to navigate the pitfalls of live stream and cameras and uploading to the church websites and other technical issues. But when the pandemic began to drag on indefinitely, they, the energy waned and was replaced with what White described as a grinding spirit of just having to persevere that settled over them. For about eight months in, he began to experience what he called decision fatigue, which he defined as fearing that no matter what decision you make, there's always a group that's not happy and vocal about it. Does that sound familiar? And so we are finding our space where it's so easy to be hooked by what I call the hero performance identity. There's a crisis and therefore a hero is needed. And if we step into the hero performance identity and we stay there too long, it's very easy for us to become burnt out and therefore pendulum swing into the avoidance-driven identity. Because many people believe that it is our responsibility to own somebody else's workout. Now, our job is to empower people, not do the work out for them. Hebrews 12.2, work hard to show the results of your salvation. So how do we do that? Now, the reality is also we live in a world where everybody's victim to something. Would you agree? But the only difference between a victim and a victor is choice. Both can be victim to circumstances, but one will choose to live victoriously despite what they're going through. Scripture talks about victims, but it's not as politically correct as calling them a victim. You know what Scripture calls a victim? A fool. Listen to this. Fools, eight, oh, sorry, Proverbs 18, 2 to 3 says this. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. In other words, fools don't want to learn. For Proverbs uh, 26, 11 says, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats its own foolishness. They're indiscernible. Do you know what the biblical wisdom for a fool is? Proverbs 23, verse 9, don't waste your breath on fools, for they will despise the wisest of advice. Sometimes we've got to stop talking. I love the story of the parable of the prodigal son. Not the parable, the story of the prodigal son. I often wonder what the conversation between the dad and the son was before he left home. Hey, dad, I've got this business plan. Give me my money. You know, my mates and I, we're going to go into the world. Hey, my boy, I want to teach you some wisdom. I don't think that's the right thing to do. No, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, you're out of touch with reality. You're not in with the modern world and Bitcoin and all the things out there. You know what? Oh, I'm going to make millions. Hey, my son. Dad, I'm not interested. The father stopped talking. The son had to experience the consequences of his own choices. Until he found himself in a pigsty, and scripture says, and he said to himself, self talk is biblical, just don't do it in the lift out loud when it's full, okay? But the father didn't bring him KFC in the pigsty. You see, sometimes we have to experience the pain of our own choices before we start the journey back home. And I'm sharing all these different things with you because we're going to be engaging in all sorts of different mindsets and different spaces that people are struggling with. And sometimes people are victims and they really want to get out of their circumstances. And sometimes people are finding their identity as being a victim and they actually don't want help. And I've seen people get burnt out because they're so fixated on rescuing one person stuck in a victim mindset to the point where they eventually become apathetic themselves. And the reality is, is that we live in a place where this, there are trials and tribulations and troubles all around us. So what is our responsibility? If we're going to be faithful to a calling, if we're going to hold on to healthy emotional, spiritual well-being, We've got to strip off weights. We need to consider what am I carrying that does not belong to me? We need to shift from worry 
to prayer. Worry is focusing on something that I do not have control over, but prayer is focusing into something that I know is connected to somebody who does have the power and the authority to do something. And then it's my responsibility to not become wary. One of the things that I'm passionate about, especially for those who feel called, is that I want to see every single one of you cross the finish line of faith and hear one day a well done, good and faithful servant. Because if statistics says that nearly 50% of pastors are wanting to give up and you will put your hands up because you feel called, I don't want to see half of you give up because it's not going to be an easy journey. I heard many of the guys say who felt called to church plants that, you know what, like if they had known what they had known, you know, maybe, but it's like it's been tough, but they would never give it up. It's kind of like being a parent. Being a parent, they say, is the best way to ruin your life. <laughs> I'm a mom of two boys, and it's so true. I can love them, and they can drive me nuts literally seconds apart, and then go straight back to loving them. And like, oh, I can't wait to have some time away, and then you have time away, and all you do is miss them. You're like, can we not actually ever be happy? But the reality is, is that we've got to manage these spaces, and we've got to manage them with wisdom. One of the last key spaces I want to speak into is how do we not allow the tensions and the trials and the stresses of the world to cripple us and to hold us back from living in the fullness of our calling. Because I believe all of us are called. How do we manage troubles and tensions and not allow them to dishearten us? The reality is, is that when I'm facing a tension or a trouble, if I don't have anything else to look at, and that's all I see, then eventually what starts to happen is my tension and my trouble becomes my truth. So we need to hold on to truth to help us manage the tension. There was a time where the disciples got in the boat with Jesus, and a storm hit. Jesus was sleeping. The disciples saw the waves crashing over the boat. And they woke up Jesus in a panic. And they said to Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die. You see, sometimes we're so fixated on the troubles and the tensions and the storm that we lose sight of the one that's in the boat with us. Eventually, the storm and the tension becomes our truth. So how do we manage tensions and troubles and storms and calamities well when we're exhausted? How do we not give up? How do we keep persevering in this journey of faith and calling? And I want to end off by speaking quickly back in Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, where it tells us about stripping off every weight, especially the sin that trips us up. And it says us to this, that let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And this is how we do it, it says. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And so I want us to take just a few minutes to look at how did Jesus deal with calamities when he was facing tensions and trials and troubles in his life? How did he process that well so that he didn't allow the calamity to dishearten him? Because a lot of people are feeling incredibly disheartened through the tensions and the struggles of the world around us. And so when we look at Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46, and I'm not going to read through all of it, but I'm going to just pick up five key things we can learn from it. This is where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there are five things that we can learn from this space. The first thing that it says is that Jesus went to an olive grove called Gethsemane. The first thing he did when he was facing an overwhelming calamity is he found a place to retreat. Where do you go to to recharge your batteries when you're wrestling with things? My, my, my diary has been incredibly crazily busy for the last three, four months, traveling all over the place. I've had to intentionally create retreat spaces to recover. Sometimes we need to take ownership of what we need in order to heal. Where are you retreating? 
Take time to process tough tension spaces. You see, you cannot defeat what you don't define. If you're struggling with something, you don't know what it is, and it's causing you to be disheartened and stressed, maybe you need to find a safe space, and it doesn't even have to be somewhere away. It might just be a corner in your garden where you can just be at peace and talk to God. But find safe retreat spaces to process difficult spaces. The second thing it says, that he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. The second thing he did is he revealed. He got the emotion that he was struggling with out. Negative toxic emotion is like vomit. You know what it feels like when you've got food poisoning and you're nauseous? You know what's coming. And it's like, oh, I don't want to do this. But eventually, once you vomit, how much better do you feel afterwards? You can hear I'm a mom of boys, eh? We talk about vomits and farts. It's great fun. <laughs> you cannot dream of cooking a Sunday roast when you're nauseous with bitterness. Emotion is always better out than in. When your emotions are triggered, it means your reptilian brain is activated. It means your thinking prefrontal cortex is turned off. You cannot think clearly and logically when you're overwhelmed with emotion. Find safe spaces and safe people that you can get your emotion out with. Even Jesus got his emotion out. He expressed what he was feeling to his closest people. You cannot heal what you don't reveal. The third thing he did is that he then said, he went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying to his father. The third point is that he wrestled. It was the father that called him, and it was back to the father that he wrestled with. If we want to stay faithful to calling in the midst of calamities and trials and tensions, if we want to stay faithful to our faith, then sometimes we need to go back to the father and wrestle with him. Have you ever watched wrestling? I often think to myself when watching wrestling, why don't they just ask someone for a hug rather? I mean, it's more <laughs> respectable. You know, there's, there's a lot of intimacy that happens with wrestling. You can't wrestle in isolation. And that's what I love about wrestling with God. When you're struggling with stuff, wrestle with him. He's not going to be offended by you struggling. Because he's the one that calls you. He already knows what's going on inside of you because he knit you together. Pour out your heart to God. Wrestle. The fourth thing is that D Jesus repeated. He came back to the disciples. He spoke to them. He went back to the Father. He came back to the disciples. He went back to the Father. Sometimes we need to engage in the process where we work through the things we're struggling with. We work through the tensions, the frustrations, the disappointments, the heartaches, the weariness, the despair, the, the I'm just over people and angry with people and the way they've just betrayed me and I'm just frustrated and over everything. I remember I met with a, a mentor many years ago. I was going through one of those times where I was just, as they say in Afrikaans, gutful. I don't know many Afrikaans words, but I know that one. <laughs> I was gutful. I was just over it. I was so tired of the fickle, fragile, fallible fallenness of people that betrayed and let me down again and again. And he said this to me. He said, Matt, Loving people the way you were recreated to love them will cost you your life. You know, it's one of those clap and a hugs. You're like, I don't really want to hear that, but I need to hear that. It's not going to be easy. And it's hard sometimes. It can be lonely. But God is saying to us that we need to push into him in our most difficult spaces. And here's the fifth point. We rise. As Jesus went through this process, he says this, rise, let's go, here comes my betrayer. 
What I loved about this is that when Jesus was facing his biggest calamity the night before he was about to be crucified, he retreated, he revealed, he wrestled, he repeated, and he kept doing that until he was able to rise and face his betrayer with a confidence and a boldness because he knew what he was called to. When we feel like giving up, We need to be pushing into the arms of the Father and wrestling through our stuff so that we can hold on to truth and rise above tensions, that we can hold on to our calling and rise above calamity, that we can hold on to boldness and rise above betrayal. What are you holding on to in the storm? The boat? The oars? The life jackets? Or you're holding on to Jesus who's in the boat with you. You see, your experience of any trial and tribulation changes when you know who's in the boat with you. I want to call the band to come up. And I want to create a space for ministry. Because I know that there are some people who may be feeling overwhelmed and tired. And it's been a long journey. And maybe there are some of you who have been betrayed And you've experienced the fickleness of community around you that's just let you down. Or maybe you're tired because you've had expectations put on you and you're weary from the expectations. Or maybe you're in circumstances and you're just worried because all you can see is the waves crashing over your boats and you've lost sight of truth. And maybe you're just on the verge of You're too tired that you don't want to do anything anymore. So here's what I want you to do. I don't know where you're at and what you're wrestling with, but can we just create a space where we can do some work and some wrestle with the Father? And so if you have felt any of those things that I've described today, I want you just to stand with me. If you're feeling weary, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling like you're carrying weights, if you're feeling like you've, you've got bitterness in your heart because of betrayal or burnout and you just want to give up, I want you to stand. And I want to pray for you. And I don't know if we're going to just have some time of worship. We've got a song that we can just play. But I want to just commit this time where God can just start to speak into your lives. And can I encourage you in your quiet times, in the weeks ahead, to find retreat spaces to find safe people that you can pour out your emotion to and that you can persevere in the process and wrestle with God and ask him to remind you of the calling that he placed in you so that you can rise again with the confidence of knowing you are called so that you finish this race well. If there's someone standing next to you, Don't you want to pray with me, with them, whether you want to just lay hands on them or just we can pray for everyone around. We're called to empower and encourage each other. This is the body of Christ. We each have a role and a place to play. And if there are injured parts in the body, if there are weary parts in the body, then we need other body parts to step up and lean into those spaces. And so, Father, I just lift up each person here right now. You know, the burdens and the weights and the weariness and the despairs that they're carrying. Father, I pray right now that you will meet each person where they are. That through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you'll breathe fresh life again into their spirits. I pray, Jesus, that you will be a safe space for us to pour out our burdens and our hurts and our betrayals before you. Father, I pray for a fresh and filling of your spirit. That you'll remind each one of the calling that you've placed in their hearts, the uniqueness of what you have for them. And Jesus, I pray that you will also remind every person here That when you see them, you see sons and daughters. You don't just see ministers, you see your children. That our identity is in you as a son or a daughter of the King. 
And from that space, we go forth. But Father, won't you right now just refill and refresh, we pray.